Welcome to a new vlog. Today I'm gonna tell you the story of how I failed again at designing this FT232H circuit, which some might say it's too simple to get wrong, but Murphy is always there to show us the opposite. So stick with me in this video and I'm gonna tell you what I got wrong this time. This is my first attempt at designing with the FT232H and if you're wondering how the FT232H is different from the standard FT232 or other typical USB to serial converters, well, it's different because this chip has a thing called MPSSE which stands for Multi-Protocol Synchronous Serial Engine. This allows it to emulate a variety of serial protocols like JTAG, I2C, SPI or general purpose bit band. So a couple of years ago I designed this blue breakout board and almost everything was right except uh, for the fact that I got the USB data lines mixed up which prevented the chip from enumerating correctly on the USB bus. So this year because I got a couple of uh, FPGA boards. I thought why not redesign this board to fix the data line issue and I'll add a couple of new features that would make it a very useful tool to have in the lab. And so I started designing this new board which uh, I call Voltag and there are a couple of things that I absolutely uh, wanted to have here and the first one was uh, a USB Type-C port. I decided to only use USB Type-C sometime at the end of last year so every new board uh, that I designed needs to have a USB Type-C well if it has a USB connection at all and the second thing I wanted to have is the ability to level shift the JTAG signals. Because by default the FT232H might be running at 3.3 volts and so its IO voltage will be 3.3 volts and that might be fine if you're using it to connect to an Arduino or an ESP32 or an STM32 just because all of those run at 3.3 volts. But since I wanted to also use this board as a JTAG interface for FPGAs there might be cases where these FPGAs have the IOs running at 2.5 volts or 1.8 volts. So I wanted the uh, flexibility to level shift these signals to whatever is needed down to at least 1.5 volts. Now the obvious solution was to add a uh, level shifter in the circuit and I went with the uh, 74 AVC 8245 because it was capable of operating between 1.4 and 3.6 volts. The datasheet hints its operation at even lower voltages, but this uh, even in its standard operation covered my voltage level range. The second reason was that it had quite good data rates, 170 megabits per second for the 1.8 volts and lower ranges and 320 megabits per second for higher than 1.8 volts. And best of all, it's an eight channel transceiver, meaning I could get my five signals for JTAG on a single chip, which would lower the cost and simplify the assembly process. And if I ever needed to interface the FT232H uh, to something else that's running at 5 volts, that would also be possible by connecting directly to the chip I.O. via uh, these pin headers because even though the uh, FT232H is running at 3.3 volts, its I.O. is 5 volt tolerant. So with this design, we should be covered from 1.4 volts up to 5 volts, uh, which is pretty neat. I also threw in some uh, protection features like a PTC for the 5V USB line and some ESD protection diodes, the usual stuff. After deciding on these factors I quickly got the uh, PCB layout done in KiCad and sent the Gerber files to PCBWay.com. I used their complete assembly service for this project and same as always they did a superb job and delivered me the fully assembled boards as you see here. If you are interested in the design, check out the links I've placed in the description of the video. There will be a link to GitHub where you'll find the uh, KiCad project, the Gerber files, the bill of materials, everything I use for this project. And while you are there, why not smash that like button because it's free and it really helps the channel grow. I went with the gold finish for these boards. This isn't necessary for the design of the board, but it does make the board look so much nicer. And you know that excitement when you get a new board? even more so when you get a new fully assembled board you just want to plug it in and see if it works and this is what i got unknown usb device now when i get these kinds of messages i start looking for the issue on the uh, usb side of things so i check the uh, usb connector for shorts uh, I check the data lines just to see if I didn't make the same mistake twice. I check the fuse. I check the uh, chip is powered with the correct voltages, but everything looked fine. So then I proceeded with uh, removing 
this ESD protection diode from the board and this magically solved the USB issue. The board was now enumerating correctly. And the protection diodes that I use for this project are the SP0504BAHTG from Little Fuse. And if we take a look at the datasheet, we notice the common anode on pin 2. So the package should match what we have in the schematic. And the device is actually recommended for these kinds of applications. So I'm not sure what's going on here, but these diodes are preventing the board from correctly enumerating on the USB side. Normally, I would probably suspect the diodes for the incorrect load capacitance uh, caused on the data lines, but since these are rated for USB use, I'm out of ideas here. So if you have any hints on why this is causing issues, please leave a comment below. And this was issue number one, but there is more. So now after removing the diodes, USB was functional and I proceeded with testing the board board further and I connected uh, the uh, pin header IOs labeled with uh, JTAG uh, to a Raspberry Pi because it was something I had on my desk, I knew it had JTAG interface so I could use it for this test. And after messing with OpenOCD for a good hour to get the configuration right and learn how to use it, I successfully had OpenOCD connect via JTAG to the processor on this Raspberry Pi board. The next thing I tried was to connect via the uh, special uh, JTAG port that goes through the voltage level translator, uh, but with this it was not connecting to the chip. And now let's take a good look at the schematic of the voltage level translator and see if you can figure out what's wrong. Now if you know how a JTAG interface works, you probably know that you typically have five signals total with four of them in one direction and one in another di direction. With the voltage translator chip that I used, I had only one direction pin and it was tied high. This meant all eight bits on the chip were connected in a single direction. It can't function like that, not if you want JTAG. And this is issue number two. And unfortunately, there is no easy fix uh, for this one, the board just needs to be redesigned and we have a couple of options here. Either uh, use a transceiver that has an individual di direction pin for each bit and configure those accordingly or use two separate chips, one configured for a direction and the other one in the opposite direction or even a combination of these two solutions depending on what's available these days because in case you forgot, the chip shortage cr crisis is still here and I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. And this is my friends how I screwed up the FT232H board for the second time. But who knows, maybe I'll have good luck the third time. I'm not stopping now. I would really love to hear your stories in the comments below if you've had similar moments and I'm even more interested in hearing how you would solve this uh, JTAG voltage translator issue with as few components as possible, keeping it low cost and using easily sourceable chips. Sure, we could probably use the classical uh, MOSFET voltage level translator and pick some low VGS MOSFETs that would satisfy our conditions, but then you would need at least 5 MOSFETs and 10 resistors, so I would probably prefer to pay a little more for one of these uh, transceiver chips or two with individual direction pins, but then again, they might not be in stock given the chip shortage, so there are trade-offs with each decision, but maybe you have a better idea, so let me know in the comments below uh, how you would solve this issue. That was all for today. Don't forget, you can support the channel on Patreon with as little as $1 per month. You can message me there. You get access to behind the scenes stuff. But if you don't feel like doing that, just hitting that like button on this video would make me very happy. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.